So yeah, so I'll be talking about uh, offline and online learning for contextual stochastic optimization. Um, I want to acknowledge first my collaborators. Uh, so I'll be speaking about uh, a line of work, uh, so a series of papers that uh, were done with these uh, excellent people. So uh, Adam Elmash Tube, Othman El Balgiti, Ambuj Tawari, Hewan Liu, uh, Meng Kui, and, and Max Shen. Um, so uh, I'll point out uh, the various papers uh, as I get to them, but I just want to thank my collaborators for uh, for their, uh, their help with this, uh, this great work. So um, yeah, so let me uh, uh, give the outline of the talk. Um, so I'll start basically with some uh, preliminary uh, notions and, and basically set up for the um, general uh, area of contextual stochastic optimization that we'll examine in this talk. Uh, and then I'll talk about a kind of brief review of my uh, work on SPL plus for linear costs and what we kind of know about SPL plus uh, both theoretically and in terms of its, its sort of practical performance. Um, and, and then I'll uh, talk about some of the challenges in extending these ideas to nonlinear problems. Uh, and motivated by those challenges, we came up with uh, a new acronym called ICEO, uh, Integrated Conditional Estimation Optimization. And I'll talk about what that is and, and the approach that we take here for dealing with, with nonlinear costs. Uh, then finally, uh, hopefully if there's, if there's time, uh, I'll talk also about this online uh, contextual extension. Um, I, I will say I sort of modified the slides uh, you know, in the talk uh, plan in light of uh, some of the previous talks. So, um, so we'll see uh, how it goes. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll, we'll have some conclusions. OK, so let me, let me start with these uh, preliminaries. So thankfully, uh, several of the previous uh, talks, Hamsa, Tias, uh, Priya, uh, gave a uh, you know, nice introduction and motivation to uh, why we care about uh, these sort of uh, decision-focused learning problems or um, uh, you know, contextual optimization problems, so I don't need to uh, spend too much time on this. But uh, basically, in practice, uh, there's uh, almost always large-scale optimization problems that we're trying to solve for decision-making that involve uh, some un unknown parameters. Uh, thankfully, we can often uh, estimate or predict these parameters based on uh, um, some auxiliary kind of contextual features, um, and we have historical data that we can use to, to build models um, to do these predictions. Right. So, um, so for example, uh, you know, a basic sort of shortest path problem or a more general kind of vehicle routing problem. We may be trying to route users from different points uh, on the on the graph to other points, and uh, the optimal route for a given user would be, would be determined by a shortest path problem. Uh, the exact travel times along the network would be unknown, but we can perhaps build a model to predict these travel times based on uh, some auxiliary features like time of day, weather, uh, construction information, and so on. Uh, another example is in finance. We may be trying to uh, build a portfolio of different assets. Uh, the returns of these assets are uh, unknown and stochastic, but might be uh, predictable uh, to some extent based on uh, historical returns, news, economic factors, uh, and so on. And uh, we can think about an asset allocation problem that tries to maximize the expected return, uh, you know, subject to a bound on the variance of the portfolio, right? And try and predict these expected returns uh, based on these features. Okay, so generally speaking, uh, in this talk, I'll look at stochastic optimization problems uh, that are contextual in this format. So uh, we want to minimize uh, for any given uh, feature x, we want to minimize with respect to the decision variables w, uh, a conditional expectation of a cost function c of w comma psi uh, with respect to this random parameter psi, right? Um, and our constraints w and s are sort of fixed and, and given to us, right? So the constraints kind of represent uh, uh, the structure of the problem that is, that is known and deterministic. So for example, the structure of the network, um, the um, information that we have uh, on the portfolio's variance and so on, which we assume is, is unaffected by time. Um, so the S is given in, in known, but uh, where there is uncertainty is in the objective. And in particular, we have this unknown parameter psi um, that is a parameter of some convex cost function uh, C of W. Um, and, uh, and there is some underlying distribution of this uh, unknown parameter. Um, we won't know that distribution, right? We'll, we'll try and sort of somehow learn it based on data. But uh, there is a distribution, and um, for any given context feature x, I'm ultimately interested in solving this contextual problem, right? I'm ultimately interested in uh, minimizing the conditional expectation of my cost given x uh, with respect to psi, right? So we're trying to understand this relationship between x and psi, uh, and, and ultimately um, what we care about is really the um, conditional uh, expectation of the cost given x. Okay, and feel free to interrupt me with questions uh, at any time. 
Um, so, uh, so in this talk, I'm going to highlight some you know, fundamental statistical and, and computational uh, concerns and, and results that we've developed for several different methodologies uh, for these types of contextual stochastic optimization problems. Um, all of them will uh, take into account the fact that uh, the predictions that we're building are inputs to this downstream uh, optimization problem, right? That ultimately our objective is to, uh, is to consider this type of uh, contextual stochastic problem, right? So this is all under this umbrella, you know, broadly speaking about uh, predict and optimize, end-to-end -end learning, decision-focused learning, decision-aware learning, whatever you like to call it. Yes. You formulate it as a stochastic optimization problem, so would you call this two stages, one stage, no? Uh, I mean, so this could uh, perhaps uh, account for two stage problems uh, in a in a simple way, right? Um, by uh, by having a, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, simple two stage problems, right? Because I'm assuming like convexity of the cost function here, right? Uh, you could model something like that in this framework, but just generally speaking, it is a, a contextual. Uh, stochastic problem. It wouldn't be hard to add additional uh, variables for two stages, but here, for simplicity, it's really just uh, one variable w. Yeah. One vector of variables, right? Vector of variables, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, um, so let me give some examples. Yeah, so for example, uh, linear cost functions uh, uh, would fall into this framework. Uh, in, a, in the linear case, right, our objective function is just uh, C transpose W, um, and I, I use this, uh, you know, abusive notation in the linear case um, to, to just uh, avoid the dependence on psi. Uh, a a nonlinear problem, a uh, classic example is, for example, the multi-item news vendor. Uh, here we have D different products. We're trying to predict the demand of these products. So psi represents the demand uh, of the product. Uh, and there is uh, overage and underage costs on, uh, on whether we um, uh, to predict uh, over or above the actual value of the demand, uh, and, uh, and these costs are HL and BL. And so our objective function is the sum over the products of uh, this news vendor cost for each product. Right? Uh, but we may have constraints linking the order decisions of the different products. For example, uh, a simple capacity constraint on the total number of orders that we can make. Um, but there may also be other constraints as well, things like um, you must have a minimum order amount for certain products or certain groups of products. Um, or um, uh, ordering constraints that say that you, know, you have to order um, uh, one product with another, and so on. Uh, and then another example might be something like a minimum cost convex flow problem. Right? So this is like some extension of the shortest path problem, where uh, there is a cost function associated with each edge, uh, which is a convex function uh, that is stochastic. Right? Um, so, uh, so in this case, uh, S would be the network flow polytope. Okay, um, so let me start with the linear case and review uh, what we've done in that case. So, uh, so again, I don't need to spend too much time on this because uh, uh, TS actually already gave a really nice uh, introduction uh, to, to SPL plus and some of the things that we know about SPL plus, which I really enjoyed. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go through this one fairly quickly. Uh, so, um, so basically, one thing that I want to emphasize uh, is that the, the linearity assumption actually uh, in a very basic but very critical way, uh, buys us something uh, really important. Um, and uh, so in the linear case, right, our objective is you know, minimize this linear function, C transpose W, um, the conditional expectation of that function. And uh, based on this linearity property, right, we have this sort of obvious uh, but really powerful fact that the minimum of the conditional expectation of the cost is exactly equal to the minimum of uh, a singular linear optimization problem where our objective cost vector in this linear optimization problem is exactly the regression function, right? It's exactly the expected value of C given X. Um, and this, uh, this is really, again, basic but critical because it tells us that it's sufficient to focus on predicting uh, this uh, uh, conditional expectation of C, right? In other words, it's sufficient to focus on, uh, on, on trying to learn the regression function of C. Um, so, so that's basically how all of the developments in the linear case proceed, uh, is from this observation, right? Because this means that now the predict and optimize process itself is sort of a sufficient process, right? So what exactly is the, the predict and optimize process, right? It's this idea that um, we form a, a, a nominal optimization uh, problem given uh, some prediction of the cost vectors, which I call c hat, uh, minimize c hat transpose w. 
And, um, and then given any new feature of vector x, we make our prediction uh, of c hat based on x, right, using some prediction function. Then we make some uh, decision, w star of c hat, which is an optimal solution to that problem. And then ultimately, we incur some cost uh, with respect to whatever value of c is actually realized, right? Ultimately, the time that we travel along the network is determined by um, whatever uh, uh, travel times we actually incurred. Okay, so, uh, so I argue, you know, in, in this setting that uh, not all loss functions are created equally, right? So, uh, so this, uh, this picture of a simple polyhedral case kind of illustrates that, right? So, um, so this is uh, a polyhedral feasible region where uh, I've drawn the um, actual realized value of the cost vector, actually negative the cost vector, that's um, negative C. Uh, over here, and then I've drawn around uh, this actual realized value of the cost vector um, the level set of the standard choice, right? What is the standard choice? It's just the least squares loss function, right? Um, one half c hat minus c two norm squared, and um, and I've also drawn right this cone which corresponds to uh, the cone of all other cost vectors uh, that would lead to the same optimal decision as as c. Right, so it's the cone that uh, corresponds to uh, any uh, any cost vector that would lead to the same decision as C. And of course, if our prediction leads to the same decision as C, then uh, we make uh, the correct decision, and there's really no decision loss. Right. Um, on the other hand, uh, we see that for the uh, you know, so we see that basically for the for the least squares loss function, this level set um, contains some points that lie in this cone, but but some that do not. Right. In other words. Um, all these points uh, along the circle, which are created equal from the perspective of the least squares loss function, um, are not necessarily equal with respect to the decision loss. Right? They don't necessarily lead to the same uh, optimal decision, and, and only some of them lead to the correct one. Right? Those that lead to the correct one are those that are in the cone. So this sort of motivates us to consider the, the SPL loss, which exactly measures the cost with respect to this, this downstream problem. Um, and uh, you can think of it as the cost that's actually incurred based on your uh, um, perhaps incorrect decision due to the prediction c hat minus the optimal cost in hindsight, right? And then if we're you know building a model based on data, we may want to ultimately minimize this uh, uh, empirical SPL loss uh, on the on the training data. Um, and as TS introduced uh, uh, yesterday, uh, because the SPL loss is is uh, difficult to work with, uh, it's in fact uh, not even a continuous function usually. Um, we yeah. I have a question. So um, the feasible set S that you introduced earlier, uh, when we were thinking about solving over uh, C in the distribution dx, right? Mm -hmm. S remained the same. Yeah. Right? But now we're talking about averaging over n different x's, mm -hmm. right? Is the S still the same? Yes, S is still the same, yeah. Even when we change the x? Yes, yeah. So x only affects the, there's only some relationship between x and the uncertain parameter of the objective. So, in, like for example, in the traffic, the traffic example that you gave, what mm -hmm. did that correspond to? So that corresponds to the, there's some features and then there's some relationship between the travel times on the network, but the network itself is fixed. So the structure of the network is stable in some sense and the, the graph is not changing. All right, so the network flow polytope is, is the same. But uh, the cost vector, which is the edge, the travel times on the edges, is perhaps changing based on uh, information that you're gathering from these like features. Time of the day, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So, so one x will be one time of day, yeah. and we would be predicting, let's say, all the edges of the network. Yeah. Be... Simultaneously predicting the travel time along every edge of a fixed, stable network. It's uh, one x, yeah. and then yeah. another time of day is another x. Yes. But the, but the s is still the same. S is still, still the same. The yeah. Connectivity. Yeah. Yeah. And you need the same uh, source target pair too. Yeah, that's true as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you change the source and target pair, you get into multitask uh, type of stuff. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so yeah. So basically, uh, uh, you know, optimizing this SPL loss is not tractable. So, um, so motivated by ideas of machine learning, we introduced this idea of a surrogate loss function, SPL plus, which is directly informed by uh, by the downstream problem. Um, and um, importantly, it's an upper bound on SPO and is convex. Um, so, so TS gave a really nice, uh, uh, in, some nice intuition for this function, which I, I enjoyed. Um, and uh, I'll just give a little bit more. So, uh, so basically, 
um, it arises from some kind of dual interpretation of the original SPO loss. But, uh, but intuitively, what, what it's saying is essentially, uh, if your prediction C hat is in um, the same cone that C is in, right, the correct cost vector, uh, and also is sufficiently large, uh, then um, the optimal decision of this uh, perturbation 2C hat minus C actually will correspond exactly to the correct optimal decision given C as well as the same one for C hat because they're in the same cone. Uh, and, uh, and that means in that case that you get cancellation in the SPO plus loss and it reduces exactly to SPO. Uh, so, um, so this is uh, uh, you know, some additional uh, intuition. Question? Yeah. You want to go first? No, you're okay. So uh, the, because it's a linear optimization problem, you have scale invariance, right? So alpha times C for positive alpha gives the same optimal solution. That's right, yeah. But somehow this is very sensitive to it, right? Very sensitive to, to the... To, to magnitude, right? So, so mm -hmm. the prediction, if, if uh, C hat is, you know, 10 times larger than it should be, you pay for that in the loss because of the second term. No? Uh, so you care it, about magnitude. The magnitude uh, sort of cancels out with each other in some ways. Um, I mean, if you got the correct answer, it definitely cancels out because you get cancellation of that negative two inside the maximum with the cancellation over here. So that's the loss so, zero case. Yeah, that's the loss zero case. But in, every, in general, you may care about the magnitude. In general, the magnitude may, may affect it, yeah. It's not uh, invariant to the magnitude in general. Uh, but that's going to be a property of convex functions in general. So it's something we sacrifice uh, to get the convexity. Yeah, I guess at the end, if you solve for this, you can take the solution and scale it. You can take the, any time your model predicts a C hat, mm -hmm. you can scale it based on the historical mean. You could, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. And then you can yeah. bring it to the same. Uh, sure, you could do some kind of post-processing of the and, model. And then you to, bring down yeah. the mean squared error. I mean, that's what I'm thinking about. Because the yeah, you, you, could, you could also just like add mean squared error as another term to your, sure, your right, right. optimization as well. Yeah, but that's another way to do it, trying to achieve that. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yes. I also wanted to just point out like this assumption that C hat is sufficiently large. And so when we do gradient descent learning, initially that's absolutely not the case. And so we've seen some very funky stuff going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, this is a good point. Yeah, it can be kind of um, less stable in the early iterations, I, I think, as you point out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, eventually it sort of will, will stable out, hopefully, but yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, so um, yeah, so now we can, you know, we can kind of work with this SPL plus loss function instead. Um, and the convexity uh, is uh, the most important benefit computationally. Um, and, uh, and we can solve it with gradient methods, stochastic gradient methods. Um, it can be directly plugged into PyTorch. Uh, Elias has done some nice work developing a package to, to do that. And there also are, um, you know, uh, strategies that have been developed by, uh, by Tios and, and his collaborators uh, for other practical computational improvements. Um, in terms of the theory, uh, uh, what we developed in the original paper was a notion of Fisher consistency. So consistency questions are basically asking, uh, if you solve the, uh, the problem with the surrogate loss, do you actually recover the answer uh, for the original loss function that you cared about? Um, and this is a classical topic in statistics. Uh, and uh, the Fisher consistency is the most basic version, which assumes that actually the distribution of the data is totally available. Um, in that case, uh, we demonstrate some sufficient conditions to guarantee the Fisher consistency. Um, um, in particular, uh, we assume uh, that uh, the uh, hypothesis class includes the true answer, the, the correct answer we're looking for, the regression function, um, as well as that the conditional distribution of C given X uh, has a positive density everywhere and is centrally symmetric. Um, these conditions are both needed, actually. We have counterexamples that show um, that um, you may not learn the correct answer um, if either one of these are violated. Um, more interestingly and more recently, um, we've done work to try and um, get more quantitative versions of consistency. Right? So, uh, so Fisher consistency is not practical because we never know the true distribution. Right? We don't really know the distribution D of the data. Uh, we just have the data. Right? Um, on the other hand, if we have samples that are drawn IID from this distribution, uh, then we can um, maybe get an approximate guarantee with high probability on, uh, on the excess uh, SPO plus risk, for example, with empirical risk minimization. Right? Such guarantees come from um, classical um, theory uh, for convex losses. So the 
quantitative consistency question, uh, this idea of risk bounds, is basically asking uh, if we're able to obtain a, a guarantee of, of delta with respect to the surrogate, the SPO plus, right, if we can guarantee that F satisfies excess SPO plus risk is less than or equal to delta, does that imply that actually uh, the excess SPO risk is less than or equal to epsilon, right? Uh, and, uh, and we want to understand, of course, the relationship uh, between epsilon and delta, right? So, uh, so what, is, uh, what is epsilon as a function of delta? And, uh, and this is exactly what risk bounds in, in this related notion of calibration functions uh, are studying. And uh, they've been developed uh, previously in the predict and optimize context for, for the least squares loss function, um, as well as previously in machine learning uh, uh, for, um, for classical uh, loss functions. Okay, so the result that we develop, or, or one of them in, in the polyhedral case, um, again, works under all the assumptions from before. So, um, so we uh, make this sort of ideal assumption that says that uh, we can actually recover the correct answer. This, this assumption is, uh, is needed to, to be able to, um, to guarantee that uh, the expected, uh, uh, you know, the regression function is in our hypothesis class. It's just uh, real, re realizability? Yeah, realizability, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, or in other words, um, no model misspecification. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is also pertaining to the polyhedral case. And uh, we make stronger versions of the assumptions from the Fisher consistency result, uh, in particular, not only does the distribution C given X have positive density everywhere um, and is centrally symmetric about its mean, uh, but it's also lower bounded by a normal density, right? So there's some uh, quantitative lower bound on, this, uh, on the density function. Uh, then we show that the SPL plus risk uh, satisfies a, a uniform bound of this type, um, where the dependence of delta on, on epsilon is, uh, is epsilon squared, right? So, uh, so basically, if you want to satisfy the excess SPO risk to some uh, level of epsilon, you need to set delta equal to order epsilon squared. This O notation is just hiding some natural constants that depend on, on the geometry of S, uh, as well as the, the properties of um, the normal distribution that lower bounds are conditional uh, distribution. And we also show that this is tight and, and, and can also be improved with curvature assumptions on, on S. So, um, so something that I find quite interesting is that these curvature assumptions on S often lead to uh, improvements. Uh, so somehow smoothness of the feasible region um, leads to more regularity in these problems, uh, which uh, enables us to improve this result, for example, to, uh, to delta equals order epsilon. So, uh, so we can um, cut out that uh, dependence of epsilon squared. Okay, uh, so um, in addition, we uh, have developed some generalization bounds. So generalization bounds uh, ask uh, a sort of related but, but slightly different question, which is, um, can we even relate the uh, empirical risk to, to the expected one? Uh, and uh, can we get a bound on their, their absolute difference? Uh, and uh, based on IID samples from the underlying distribution. So, um, so for similar reasons that uh, the SPO plus loss is hard to optimize, it is also hard to develop these generalization bounds. Standard theory uh, does not carry through. So, um, so we developed the first uh, real generalization bounds uh, in this setting based on uh, combinatorial notions like uh, extensions of VC dimension to uh, multi-class problems, um, as well as stronger margin-based bounds uh, that have improved uh, dependence on the uh, underlying dimension when your distribution satisfies certain uh, favorable properties. So I'm not going to speak about the details of this. I just wanted to mention that, that we have uh, developed these. OK, um, so, so next I want to move on uh, to the, to the nonlinear case um, and talk about some of the challenges here and some of the ways that we overcame them, although I think still there's a lot of interesting uh, work to be done in this nonlinear case. So, uh, so returning back to our general uh, nonlinear contextual stochastic optimization problem, um, I argue that predict and optimize really cannot solve this problem um, in general. And, uh, and that's coming, again, from this basic fact that uh, what makes predict and optimize sort of a sufficient condition to solve this problem is the linearity of the objective, right? Because it tells us that just learning the regression function, expected value of c given x, is enough when you have a linear objective. Um, but when you have a nonlinear objective, that's, that's no longer the case, based on the simple fact that the optimal solution of some convex combination of functions is not going to be uh, attained at, at either of the 
uh, optimal solutions of the original functions. Right? It's somewhere in the middle. Right? Uh, and here we're trying to really optimize you know, a convex combination of functions for any given x. Right? So inherently, we need some way to estimate the conditional distribution uh, of, of psi given x right? in general. Um, unless we can exploit some other type of structure of the problem, um, generally speaking, we will need to estimate this conditional distribution. Okay, so let me mention a few selected related works. So, uh, so Bertsimas and Kellis have looked at this similar sort of problem. Um, they don't propose any um, new decision-focused methods. Instead, they look at existing machine learning methods and, uh, and look at how these methods estimate the conditional distribution and basically plug that into the downstream problem. Um, they study the sort of statistical properties of that um, and uh, compare and contrast uh, various different methods for uh, for taking the way that, for example, random forest or uh, a decision tree might estimate the conditional distribution and uh, plugging that into um, to this contextual problem. Uh, more recently, Callis and Mao have considered actually training random forest methods um, with the decision-focused objective in mind, right? So something that's, uh, that's more uh, akin to... Um, uh, you know, just decision-focused learning or end-to-end -end learning, uh, they, uh, they try and train the random forest in a way that um, optimizes for the downstream cost. Uh, and also there's, uh, you know, this whole line of work uh, uh, on differentiable optimization, um, which is closely related. A lot of that is uh, focusing on the predict and optimize. Yeah, Rahul. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that is focusing on, on, on predict and optimize, um, um, and, uh, but also as well some other um, slight different assumptions on the problem. Um, for example, dependence of the parameters on the constraints, which may somehow coerce uh, differentiability. Here, because our constraints are, uh, are just uh, a fixed feasible region, it can be harder to achieve uh, differentiability in some cases. Yeah? So the random forest type model uh, is, if, if, I, if I look at a single tree, for example, mm -hmm. this becomes like a building a tree with a stylized loss function. Exactly, yeah. So the loss function is convex in its inputs or it's more complicated? Because your framework is very, has, will do a convex relaxation in your framework. Right? Yeah, so yeah. It's nonlinear, it can be non-convex potentially. I'm trying to understand. So their, uh, their loss function will not necessarily be, uh, so their loss function will be exactly the downstream cost here, right? So, uh, so it'll be convex as a function of the W, the decision variable, but not necessarily as a function of the the model. So I'll show that in a moment for our framework. Yeah, yeah. Does this do you look similar to the, what I presented yesterday? So could you not think of you learn a model uh, that replaces the expectation? Yeah. And it, the it, it, yeah, I think a scenario which is the 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 psi and the w, and then you say optimize over that, optimize the input the w over that. You just you just learn the expectation, the nonlinear function. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's another approach, uh, and um, so uh, so basically trying to learn directly the expectation of the uh, of the cost um, is is another sort of a valid approach. Um, in fact, there's another paper of Bertimas that I forgot to mention here that kind of does that. Um, one challenge with that is dealing with the constraints. So uh, so basically, um, and uh, so. Right. Yeah, if they're, you know, they can be represented using a mixed, you know, mixed integer quadratic or linear programming. Then yeah, then yeah, right, right. So, so um, as well try, as trying to find the the right representation of the function to, to use here. Um, so they propose some methods based on uh, RKHS ideas. Um, I would argue that actually the framework, uh, the, what I'm going to show in a moment, um, is more flexible. Uh, it's going to kind of directly learn the conditional distribution um, in a way that allows for, for flexibility and sort of easy recovery of, of solutions given this estimation um, in, in a natural way. But yeah, these are also, that's also a competing approach. You know. yeah. Good. Okay, um, let, let, me, let me dive into, uh, into what we actually do. So, uh, so I, I'm going to assume here that there's a finite number of scenarios. So it is similar in a way to what, what uh, Ilias presented yesterday. Uh, actually, the, the methodology we propose also has, has a, a lot in common. So I'd be really eager to discuss more about it. Um, so, uh, so a finite number of scenarios for psi. Uh, so what that means is um, psi is in some uh, set of finite uh, 
finitely many realizations, uh, z tilde 1 through z tilde k. Uh, and so for that reason, the conditional distribution for any given x can be represented as a vector in the finite dimensional simplex. Right? So, um, so that uh, set is this delta k, which is the set of probability distributions um, with a finite support k. Right? Um, and uh, for ease of notation, I just call uh, ckw my uh, cost vector given realization uh, z tilde k. Right? So then, uh, essentially, the above problem for any given x, there exists some conditional distribution that can be parameterized in this simplex. And uh, the problem is equivalent to minimize this uh, uh, summation of uh, p star k of x times ck of w uh, over w and s. Right? So, um, so the natural idea here, then, if we care about solving the contextual problem, which we do up top, uh, is to try and learn a mapping uh, from x to p of x in the simplex. Right? So we try to learn a function that directly gives us some estimation of conditional distribution. We plug that in, and then um, we solve uh, this problem um, to obtain a decision. Right? And uh, again, this is not the only approach to solve this problem, uh, to address this. Another uh, approach, there are other approaches as well, but, but I think this one is, is quite natural, given uh, our goal of, of, of solving the contextual problem, and is also, uh, I would argue, pretty flexible, something that we'll also see uh, in the numerical results. So this looks a little bit like sample average approximation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it, so in some sense, uh, it is uh, like that, right? So basically, the fact that we care about ultimately the expectation really suggests something like sample average approximation. Um, if we cared instead about some kind of robust objective or something like that, this wouldn't really make much sense. Yeah. But here you're not doing SAA. Here, here you assume there's a finite distribution has finite support. Well, I'll get to the data in a moment, but yeah, we're, we're doing, we do assume that the distribution has finite support, yeah. yeah. And that you're going to use all of it in your estimation as well, as opposed to maybe just having a subset of it that you guessed correctly. Well, some of these could be zero if you want, but yeah, uh, but we are. Um, because like the SA analogy, that's what it would suggest, like, you might see some scenarios, but there might be a much bigger set of scenarios that you didn't use during, while fitting. Right, right. That, that, um, yeah, that, that's in theory possible, but uh, a lot of our results, in the case when number of scenarios is much bigger than the sample size, uh, our theoretical results are not going to be too informative, unfortunately. But yeah, that is still pos possible that you may be in a situation like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me, let me, yeah, Rahul, yeah. This finite support is what, one dimensional distribution, or what is the dimensional distribution that you're assuming for the finite support? Finite support means that it's a distribution uh, over. I know, but uh, how much dimensional distribution is it? Uh, is it a one dimensional histogram or a multivariate? It's the size of the object, the disease. It doesn't matter, right? Because basically the, uh, these are just like uh, indices of some random of, events, right? Some scenarios. No, I understand. My question is this, you're assuming it's a finite support distribution. So what is the dimension of that distribution? K. Capital K. But K is in the support size? The, K. the finite is supported on K many points, right? Yeah, so the dimension of the, of the distribution is the, uh, the number of so is it a one-dimensional distribution or is it a multivariate distribution? Uh, it, it doesn't matter. So because, okay, it, it's basically these, uh, these don't have to be vectors or anything, right? These don't have to be real numbers. These just are um, scenarios that are like, these are, you know, objects in some set. It, it, we have a distribution over some finite set so of so objects. That set is in what dimension? Doesn't matter. Yeah. It, it's just some set. It's an arbitrary finite set, right? It basically, they... they uh, this is um, enumerating the possible outcomes, right? So, uh, so it could be, you know, for example, something like demand, where you have a one-dimensional demand and you have different values of the demand, but it doesn't have to be. These are just enumerations of possible outcomes uh, of the uncertainty. So what is another example outside demand? So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I guess, uh, so another example in the, in the flow problem, right, uh, would, be, uh, would be something like... Um, you have uh, the costs on each edge, right? And then you have actually a much higher dimensional thing because you have, uh, yeah, different edges. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So just to make sure I get it, so the X are the features, right? Yeah. 
And and the the scenarios? Do you assume that for each feature, exactly the same scenarios hold? Yes, yeah, so there's a universe of scenarios that are possible. Yeah. So uh, so again, this is maybe a limitation in some in some cases, and it, it's a really interesting thing to try and extend this. But it's it's sort of a modeling uh, assumption, right? So it's it's saying that okay. Um, in the demand example, let's say, it's saying that we've kind of taken maybe a continuous distribution and put it into a histogram, which is discrete, right? Uh, or, um, you know, there's just is some, you know, finite, um, you know, th there might be this, you know, bad outcome, there might be this okay outcome, and this good outcome, and we have three possibilities, right? Um, but yeah, this is, um, this is, this is an assumption. Uh, so, um, so moving forward, right? Um, the way that we'll we'll proceed is uh, to to try to um, solve a problem which assumes that, um, given any uh, any mapping for estimating this conditional distribution, we plug uh, that mapping the output of f of x i uh, into our uh, our um, optimization problem with uh, with that distribution, right? Um, so we solve, minimize the sum of, of the pk's, the expected value of, of the cost, given the distribution p. Uh, so then given the historical data, right, historical data would consist of uh, pairs of feature vectors and observations of uh, some realization of the uncertainty living in this finite set, uh, as well as our, our hypothesis class of, of models uh, for estimating uh, a conditional distribution, uh, the problem that we'd solve, the, the truly um, you know, integrated approach, would be uh, to minimize the uh, empirical average of the cost evaluated on, on W star of, of f of xi, um, given the realization that actually happened um, psi sub i. All right, so we call this integrated conditional uh, estimation optimization. Okay, so, uh, so there are a lot of Questions and, and uh, you know, I wrote questions slash questions. I meant to write questions slash challenges. Um, so there are, there are challenges with, uh, with this approach. Uh, so first of all, you know, is the solution consistent? Does it generalize? Uh, what are its statistical properties, right? Um, but from the computational point of view, we have uh, inherited a lot of the same properties, uh, same challenges as, as SPL, right? So lack of continuity of this function in general, lack of differentiability, um, also Vanishing gradients, uh, something that I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on more uh, soon. So, uh, in fact, the SPO is really a special case of this of this uh, framework in some ways, uh, um, except for the assumption of the finite support, right? Um, but uh, but we can think about the the linear case as also being um, a, a special case of, of this framework, right? So so we definitely inherit all of these challenges from SPO. Yeah. Is this your empirical loss function? Yes. Yeah. And is there no regret, notion of regret? Uh, so, so the regret, I've, I've uh, yeah, I, I've just uh, brushed it under the water, right? So the regret, uh, it can also, you can also think about this as minimizing regret. That would just amount to adding another wow. negative in here, which is only dependent on the data. It doesn't depend on the model. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, uh, so to address uh, all of these concerns, we propose basically two modifications of this. One is decision regularization, um, and the other is uh, the idea of using a smooth approximation of, of W star, uh, this uh, optimal solution mapping. So what is the decision regularization? All right, so decision regularization, the idea is um, we add a small perturbation um, to the objective function inside of our, uh, our oracle uh, with a strongly convex function phi, right? So for some rho, uh, we consider W star rho, which is the solution to the conditional expectation problem given p plus rho uh, times phi. Uh, and then our uh, ICEO problem with decision regularization would be, uh, would be uh, the same thing uh, with, uh, again, some regularization in the objective function. Right? But now we're using W star rho instead of W star. Um, and this is akin to uh, the proposal of, uh, of uh, Brandon and uh, Bistra uh, with uh, uh, combinatorial problems using uh, phi of w uh, equals uh, the one half times Euclidean norm squared. Right. Um, so, uh, so what does uh, what does that buy us? Right. So, let's consider a toy example to to get some intuition. So, uh, suppose that our feasible region is just uh, this interval. 
right? So it's just the interval from zero to one, and we're doing linear cost functions, right? Uh, so uh, so our, our function is, 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 is linear. Then it's easy to see that the, the W star mapping is just a step function, right? So, uh, so if the sign of the conditional mean uh, of the cost vector uh, is, is, uh, is negative, then um, we would have a, a, a solution of one. And if it's positive, we have a solution of zero. All right, so W star is just a step function. Um, so what does decision regularization buy you then? It turns the step function into a ramp function, right? Um, so we have this uh, continuous interpolation uh, between uh, zero and one. And uh, the slope of this ramp function is gonna be proportional to one over rho, right? Okay, good. So, uh, so that makes our function continuous um, and, and in fact Lipschitz. Um, and, and based on that, we're able to prove the, the statistical guarantees, right? So, uh, so we prove um, sort of results um, similar in spirit to what I showed before, but these are actually results about uh, assuming the ideal thing, right? So assuming that you can actually solve the, the correct ICEO problem, what are the basic uh, statistical guarantees? And uh, in particular, we prove uh, asymptotic consistency and, and generalization. So, uh, so, um, so basically we prove that um, if, again, we have this well-specified realizable case, um, and the training data is some IID sequence from our distribution, as well as uh, a sequence of regularization parameters that go to zero inside of our decision regularization, the, the row parameter, then uh, almost surely for all x, we'll obtain the correct optimal decision um, under the true conditional distribution, right? Um, so that's nice. So basically it's a sanity check that verifies that, that um, solving the problem uh, uh, with the data is actually giving us the right answer that we want. Um, doesn't, doesn't the training data also have CI? Uh, psi i, right? So yeah. psi i is our. But where are the costs, the true costs? Uh, in this case, it's the nonlinear problem, right? So the psi i is actually uh, encoding the realization of the cost um, on the ith data point, right? So it uh, encodes that cost function on the ith data point. Yeah. It doesn't decompose like the linear case into a bunch of coefficients. Right, right. There's no assumption about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Rahul, yeah. So I think you can probably guess what I'm going to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, if your S is a, say, a simplex, would you use L2 or would you use a Bregman? Uh, uh, how does do the results change depending upon the choice of V? Mm, yeah, so, uh, so basically, uh, the, it's a good question. And the answer is, um, this is just asymptotic, so it's not going to change. Generalization bound is uh, going to have a constant that depends naturally on that Bregman distance. So the uh, simplex case would be more favorable to use entropy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the extension is that also for an appropriately chosen uh, row sequence, we can obtain a generalization bound. Uh, the generalization bound may not seem like the best. Um, it's still actually, we're unsure if it's tight, uh, but basically. Um, the reason why it's not quite uh, one over square root of n is because of some bias introduced by, uh, by this decision regularization. Okay, um, but uh, the real challenge then, um, after we verified the, these statistical properties is, is computationally, right? So how do we address this problem uh, computationally? Um, and I would argue that decision regularization on its own is not enough to address the computational challenge. Um, so decision regularization, Right, induces continuity of this of this mapping, right? But there still is uh, is an issue of lack of convexity and also uh, lack of global differentiability and, and and gradients which may be zero or very close to zero, right? Um, so this is another example, uh, a little bit less of a toy example than than the ramp loss uh, that shows that the, the vanishing gradient problem can really uh, can really arise. So um, so again, this is a news vendor one. Uh, the um, the 3D plot here is showing uh, so it's, it's a two scenario, right? So we have uh, probability one over scenario one, probability two over scenario two, and it's showing the first component of, uh, of W rho star uh, as a function of these two probabilities, right? Uh, and what we see are these flat regions, right? So we see uh, there are these regions where uh, W star is exactly flat, there are regions where it's interpolating between the flatness, and there are regions where it's kind of, uh, kind of approximately flat. Um, so the, the, the vanishing gradient is a real thing in, in, in this problem. Uh, so 
how do we address this? So, um, so we proposed using smooth approximations, right? So this is the very first step to address this problem. I think still there's a lot of, uh, of, of potential that can be done here. But what we do is this idea of, of smooth approximation. Um, so we want to approximate uh, w rho star with a smooth function, which I call uh, w tilde rho star, right? Uh, and, uh, and we consider various approaches for, for achieving this, right? So, so one, it's a deterministic method based on this idea of Bernstein polynomials. Uh, but in practice, really, uh, we can just um, sample points from the simplex and, and fit a model, right? So, um, so one that we show has some nice theoretical properties is polynomial kernel ridge regression. But in practice, we just use neural nets, right? So something similar to what, what Elias actually suggested yesterday, we approximate uh, this function with, with a neural network. Uh, and we fit it based on random sampling of, of points in the simplex. Uh, for each point in the simplex, we calculate the value of W star. Uh, and, and we fit a, a network that, um, that approximates uh, the, the true W star uh, to some, um, some desired accuracy um, in, in L2 norm. Right. Um, and in, in those first two cases, we can extend our previous generalization bounds uh, with an additional term that depends on, on the quality of the smooth approximation. Okay, uh, and so what does it do for us then in this toy example, right? So it basically turns the ramp loss into a sigmoid, right? So, uh, so sigmoid is still non-convex, of course, but, uh, but the gradients are at least informative, uh, at least in some places, right? So no longer is the function exactly flat uh, on, the, on the left and right side uh, of the x-axis. Um, instead, it kind of smoothly interpolates uh, between these two extremes. For, uh, yeah, Rahul. So I'm thinking I'm drawing a wild connection, but the, the, the place you have the smoothness, is, is it because it's, it's IP representable? As in, if you think of an indicator which, 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 which denotes which region you are in, and in one region, so if, if you have, have an IP representation that's going to uh, help you navigate the search space, it's difficult to navigate the search space with an IP representation. Uh, I can uh, elaborate more uh, offline, but it's, it's difficult because it, it actually changes the, the problem in a way that um, can lead to uh, the IP finding trivial solutions very easily that are not actually meaningful. So, um, so basically, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, this is actually an, a known problem with SPO as well. So if you try and model that with, with uh, IP, uh, the IP is biased towards finding solutions that uh, basically the model coefficients are always equal to zero. Yeah. And that's the optimum solution to the IP. Yeah, that's the optimum solution to the IP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is not, it, it, yeah, it's not, um, it's not, it's a slightly different formulation, so it's not exactly, uh, it, 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 the, the, the challenge is that it, it allows for too much flexibility, basically, uh, in the IP formulation. Like, because of the bi-level nature, yeah. Yeah, under the optimistic estimator, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so in this news vendor case, uh, we also see something similar, right? So we see that um, now we have this smooth uh, uh, interpolation between these different flat regions. Um, and, and it really appears in this case that the, the, the gradients are, are more informative. All right, let me show um, uh, now some uh, numerical results. Um, so, uh, so in practice, we will solve this problem um, assuming H is a neural net uh, with, with SGD. Um, so we adopt the, basically the philosophy of differentiable optimization. Uh, so uh, we show here a, a two-item news vendor problem with four scenarios. So a very toy example, but it's an example that enabled us to, uh, to compare against all of these baselines. So, uh, so in particular, the benchmarks we compare against are sample average approximation, which just ignores the features. Right, so, um, so it just uh, averages based on the historical uh, data. Um, standard estimate then optimize, which would use the exact same neural network structure that we do, um, except the loss function that it optimizes is cross entropy. Right, so it basically treats this as a multi-class classification problem where you're trying to predict one of these four scenarios uh, as your class. We also compare against these prescriptive methods of uh, the older Bertsimas and Callis paper. Um, they don't do any uh, decision-focused learning, um, but they do provide ways to use the conditional uh, distribution uh, from existing methods um, to, uh, to solve the contextual problem. What and is then, the label for cross-entropy? 
So, so you're trying to predict one of the four scenarios. So which scenario you are in as a function of x. Yeah. OK, and then uh, finally, the more recent uh, stochastic optimization forest approach uh, that I discussed. All right, so here are the results. So we show uh, for different training sample sizes, uh, the news vendor cost uh, for each of these uh, different methods. And uh, we see, um, especially when the training sample size is small, uh, the benefit of the uh, integrated approach. Right, so ICEO is in red uh, and is achieving, um, on average, a smaller um, downstream cost than the others. Um, the prescriptive methods are, 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 um, are slightly behind. Uh, in particular, the KNN appears to be more effective than the kernel method. Um, interestingly, we really thought SO Forest would be really well, uh, do really well here. Um, I think the reason it's not doing so well is uh, because of the fact that we're doing this scenario-based approach. Um, so, so that's not a, a requirement of, of SO Forest. Um, however, SO Forest is actually, in some ways, uh, with respect to the implementation, optimized for continuous distributions. So, uh, so, so we had um, some, some, to do some tricks to basically adapt SO Forest to the uh, discrete case that we consider. But even after doing those tricks, um, we found that, uh, that SO Forest does not perform um, so well, I think because of the, the fact that we're considering um, this discrete uh, situation. Uh, for continuous problems, SO Forest uh, seems to do better. Uh, the baseline SAA, uh, of course, is, is really doing the worst. And the estimate and optimize approach, interestingly, does kind of poorly with small sample sizes. Um, but of course, as the number of samples gets bigger, uh, it's going to learn a better and better model, um, and it does better and better. Um, and you know, for a large enough sample size, it essentially becomes comparable to ICEO. Uh, so I think this really indicates you know, the benefit of the integrated approach, especially um, uh, when, when, when data is limited. Uh, but also, um, as we increase flexibility of the model, we find as well that the estimate and optimize approach uh, um, doesn't scale as well. Right? So, uh, so basically, the, the integrated approach can also be, um, can be uh, helpful when uh, when you have a, a, a flexible model with a lot of data. OK, um, so there's no way I have time to talk about any of this, uh, but that's OK. Uh, so I, I'll just uh, conclude the talk. Uh, and uh, so, um, so I, I, uh, I reviewed here the predict and optimize framework and, and SPL plus approach uh, in the linear case and talked about some challenges and uh, ideas for extending this to, to the nonlinear case. Um, I, think, uh, I think there's still a lot of very interesting uh, uh, questions, both computationally and also um, in terms of uh, changes to you know, the methodology, new methodologies that can be adapted uh, for this nonlinear case. Uh, and, um, and just briefly about the online uh, thing, uh, we essentially show that you know, SPO type of algorithms can be uh, adapted to uh, online decision making settings with resource uh, constraints, which I think is a really interesting problem. Um, you could think about something like the, um, the shortest path problem or vehicle routing problem where you have uh, constraints on the congestion of the network. Right? These are real uh, constraints that, uh, that, that arise in practice. And, uh, and in practice, we are always making decisions online, so I think uh, over time. So I think this is a, a, an exciting direction for this field in general. Um, so, so the papers that this talk was mentioned on are, are, are listed here. Um, in particular, the ICEO one is, is available on, on archive since last year. And uh, I'm happy to discuss uh, any more questions now and also uh, discuss later offline. So thanks, everyone, for your attention.